My name is Anwar Majid. I am the uh, director of the Tangier Global Forum. Now I'm speaking as a director of the Tangier Global Forum, which is in its first year in, uh, in the city of Tangier, which the purpose of the forum is to bring speakers of the caliber of Eugene Rogan, uh, professor at Oxford, uh, to give lectures on great topics that are of huge interest to the community, not just in Tangier and Morocco, but in the United States, Europe, and other parts of the globe. And I know people are watching us from the United States, you know, from our main campus. So I'm saying hi to them, for those who are watching. And uh, I know some other people may be watching us from France and other places. I know this, this lecture is being uh, uh, streamed live on the internet, so anybody can go to our website and watch this lecture live and even ask questions. There are ways to send questions, either through Twitter or web forms, uh, and then we can and present those questions to the speaker at the end of his talk. Uh, just so you know also that uh, Professor Rogan speaks several languages, uh, and so if you feel comfortable asking questions in any of those languages that make you comfortable, please do not hesitate. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, I am very uh, pleased to present to you Eugene Rogan. He is a professor of Middle Eastern history at the University of Oxford and director of the Middle East Center at St. Anthony College uh, in Oxford. He received his BA in economics from Columbia and his MA and PhD in Middle Eastern history from Harvard. He taught at Boston College and Sarah Lawrence College before taking up his post in Oxford in 1991. Uh, he is the author of The Arabs, A History, which was first published, I think, in 2009. <clears throat> uh, which was named one of the best books of 2009 by The Economist, The Financial Times, The Atlantic Monthly, and other publications also praise the book. His new book, The Fall of the Ottomans, The Great War in the Middle East, published uh, recently, uh, it did in 2015, right? Yeah, uh, has been translated already into 15 languages. Uh, his earlier works, you know, the, before he published his two books, include Frontiers of the State in the Late Ottoman Empire, published by Cambridge University Press in 1999, uh, for which he received the Albert Horani Book Award of the Middle East Studies Association of North America, and the Fuad Koprulu Prize of the Turkish Studies Association. Uh, the War for Palestine, Rewriting the History of 1948, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2001 and came, back, came out in a second edition in 2007 with Avish Lime and Outside In on the Margins of the Modern Middle East was published by 2002. Uh, it goes without saying that he is one of the world's top uh, ex experts on the Middle East and the history of the Arabs uh, and now the lecture he's given us tonight uh, will basically be based on the new introduction he's writing for this book, uh, uh, the, the Arabs, A History. And so we are lucky to be once, one of the early ones to be, uh, to be listening to uh, his views on the subject. So please help me welcome Professor Rogan to the podium. Anwar, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. It is a great pleasure to be back in Tangiers, and I am honored and delighted to be part of this forum. And I um, wanted to take this opportunity to trial with you thoughts that I've had on the recent history of the Middle East and where the Middle East is going, as Anwar has said, as part of revising my earlier work on the history of the Arab world. And so these are my reflections, and I hope that in the course of our discussion afterwards that we'll have a chance to hear your views on where you think the Arab world has been and where you see it is going. And I, قبل النبدة, أريد أن أشكر المترجمين وأعدكم أنني سوف أتكلم بالبطء وإذا في أي مشكلة في الترجمة إذا في أي طريق أنت أقولي J'allais faire la même chose en français, 
mais je crois qu'il n'y a pas de, il n'y a pas de traduction française ce soir. Mais c'est, c'est seulement pour dire pendant les questions, si vous avez des questions que vous voulez vous poser en français, ça va aller aussi. Mais maintenant, continuons en anglais. Faida Hamdi is not a household name, but she learned about the downfall of Tunisia's autocratic president from within her jail cell. The date was the 14th of January, 2011, and Zain al-Abidin bin Ali had ruled over Tunisia for over 23 years. Though she didn't dare acknowledge it to her cellmates, Faida Hamdi had played no small part in the overthrow of the dictator. She was a council inspector from the small town of Sidi Bou Zaid, and she'd been accused of humiliating a street vendor whose self-immolation provoked nationwide demonstrations across Tunisia that would ultimately spark the Arab Spring. Four weeks earlier, on the 17th of December, 2010, Faida Hamdi was making the rounds of the vegetable markets in her hometown. Sidi Bouzid is one of those provincial towns in Tunisia that's neglected by both tourists and the government. A woman in her 40s dressed in an official blue uniform, her authority reinforced with stripes and epaulets. Hamdi was accompanied by two male colleagues. Most of the unlicensed vegetable sellers ran away when they saw the inspectors arriving. But Mohamed Bouazizi, a 26-year-old vendor, refused to move. Hamdi knew Bouazizi and had already cautioned him against selling vegetables near the vegetable market without a license. On 17 December, Bouazizi stood his ground and accused the inspectors of harassing him. He accused them of corruption. The altercation turned into a shouting match with Bouazizi defending his cart and the inspectors taking away his wares. There's no agreement on precisely what happened in the fateful scuffle between the inspectors and Mohamed Bouazizi. The young vendor's friends and family insisted Faida, uh, Faida Hamdi had insulted and slapped Mohamed Bouazizi. And as they argued, this was a grave insult in Middle Eastern societies for a man to be slapped by a woman in public. Faida Hamdi denied ever laying a hand on the street vendor. She claimed that Bouazizi attacked us and cut my finger when the inspectors tried to confiscate his goods. The details actually matter because Bouazizi's response was so extreme that both friends and strangers struggled to explain what he did next. Mohamed Bouazizi emerged from his encounter with the inspectors in a fury. He first sought justice from the municipal offices in Sidi Bou Zaid. But instead of receiving a sympathetic hearing, he was further humiliated with another beating. He turned next to the office of the governor, trying to take things up one level higher, but was refused an audience, which is not surprising. A street vendor would not likely get an audience with the governor of the town. At that point, something snapped. His sister, Basma Bouazizi, believed that what my brother experienced from the confiscation of his fruit cart to being insulted and slapped by a woman was enough to make him lose his mind, especially after all municipal officials refused to meet with him and he was unable to complain about this abuse. It was midday and the streets around the governor's office were crowded with townspeople when Mohamed Bouazizi covered his clothes with paint thinner and set himself on fire. The terrible image was photographed by people in the street who intervened to try and put the fire out. But the fire left Bouazizi with fatal burns covering 90% of his body. He collapsed and was taken to hospital in the nearby town of Ben Arous. Bouazizi's desperate act of self-violence left the townspeople of Sidi Bou Zaid stunned. They shared his sense of injustice that the government seemed to be working against the common people in their struggles just to get by. The same afternoon, a group of Bouazizi's friends and family 
held an impromptu demonstration outside the governor's house, the governor who would not grant him an audience. They threw coins at the metal gates shouting, here's your bribe, repeating Boazizi's claim that the officials were corrupt. The police dispersed the angry crowd with sticks, but they came back in greater numbers the next day. By the second day, the police were using tear gas and firing into the crowd. Two men shot by the police died of their wounds. Mohamed Bouazizi continued to deteriorate. The situation continued to deteriorate. Word of the protests in Sidi Bouzid reached Tunis, where an arrestive young population of graduates, professionals, and the educated unemployed spread the word of Bouazizi's ordeal by the social network. They appropriated him as one of their own. They claimed that he was a university student. Uh, we know that Bouazizi actually didn't finish high school, though interestingly, he used the income that he made to help his sisters go to university. So the appropriation was not entirely inappropriate. They created the Facebook group, and the story of Bouazizi and the demonstrations in Sidi Bouzid went viral. A journalist working for the Arab satellite television station Al Jazeera picked up the story from Facebook and put it on the air. The state-controlled Tunisian press did not report on the troubles in Sidi Bouzid, but Al Jazeera did, with its story about the underprivileged standing up for their rights against corruption and abuse. Sidi Bouzid began to run nightly on Al Jazeera's news programs to a global Arab audience. The self-immolation of Mohamed Bouazizi electrified public opinion against everything that was wrong in Tunisia under President Zin al Abidin Ben Ali. Corruption, abuse of power, indifference to the plight of ordinary men and women, and an economy that failed to provide opportunities for the young. These were not problems unique to Tunisia. They were familiar to citizens across the Arab world who were electrified by the Tunisian protest movement they followed on TV via Al Jazeera. After 23 years in power, Ben Ali had no solutions. Demonstrations spread from Sidi Bouzid to other poor inland towns like Kassarin or Thala or Menzel Bouzain before erupting in the capital city of Tunis. As tensions escalated in Tunisian cities, Ben Ali was forced to respond. On the 28th of December, a full 11 days after Bouazizi had set himself on fire, the Tunisian president paid a visit to the dying man in his hospital room. Now you have to remember the Tunisian media had not been covering the story. But now that the president went and visited Bouazizi in hospital, both the print and broadcast media covered the image with uh, great enthusiasm. Ben Ali invited Bouazizi's family to the presidential palace to meet with him. He promised to do everything he could to save the young man's life. And he ordered the arrest of Faida Hamdi, that municipal inspector who was accused of slapping Bouazizi and provoking the desperate act of self-violence. On the 4th of January, 2011, Mohamed Bouazizi died of his injuries. The street vendor was declared a martyr by the people protesting in Tunisia, and the municipal inspector, Faida Hamdi, became the scapegoat of the Ben Ali regime. She was imprisoned in Gafsa with common criminals. Widely reviled for her alleged role in Bouazizi's death, she couldn't get a lawyer willing to represent her. Hamdi kept her identity a secret from her fellow inmates. She claimed to have uh, been a teacher detained for slapping a little boy. I was afraid to tell them the truth, she later admitted. In the first two weeks of January, the demonstration spread across all major towns and cities of Tunisia. The police responded with violence, leaving 200 dead and hundreds more wounded. The country's professional army, however, unlike the police, refused to intervene on behalf of the president and act against the demonstrators. When Ben Ali realized that he no longer had the loyalty of his army and that no concessions were going to satisfy the protesters, he stunned the nation and the entire Arab world 
by abdicating power and fleeing Tunisia to take exile in Saudi Arabia on the 14th of January, 2011. Faida Hamdi, as I said, watched these extraordinary events on television with her cellmates, who did not know that she was the woman who had started the whole thing with her slap. At that point, I think Faida Hamdi's story was no longer relevant. It was the Tunisian people who were the story now. But they had achieved the seemingly impossible. They toppled one of the Arab world's long-standing dictators through peaceful, popular protest. The impact of the Tunisian revolution was felt right across the Arab world. Presidents and kings watched nervously as one of their peers was toppled by citizen action. As a president for life, Ben Ali was hardly unique. Libya's dictator, Muammar Gaddafi, had been in power since 1969. The Yemeni president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, had been ruling since 1978. The Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak, since the assassination of Sadat in 1981. And each was grooming a son to succeed him. Syria, under the Assad family's rule since November 1970, became the first Arab Republic to complete a dynastic succession when Bashar al-Assad replaced his father, Hafiz al-Assad, following his death in 2000. But if a deeply entrenched dictator could be toppled in Tunisia, analysts from across the region speculated, it could actually happen anywhere. And the Tunisian experience of frustration and repression was shared by people living under autocratic regimes across the Arab world. The late Samir Kassir, a Lebanese journalist, assassinated in June 2005, presumably by the Syrian regime, diagnosed what he called the Arab malaise years before the Arab Spring. It's not pleasant being Arab these days, he observed. Feelings of persecution for some, self-hatred for others. A deep disquiet pervades the Arab world. That disquiet set down roots through all layers of society and spread across the Arab world before exploding in the revolutionary year of 2011. Now, Egyptian civilians, or Egyptian citizens, had been mobilizing for change long before the outbreak of the Arab Spring revolutions in 2011. In 2004, a group of activists formed the Egyptian Movement for Change, better known as Kifaya, literally, enough, to protest the continuation of Mubarak's rule over Egypt and his moves to groom his son, Gamal, to succeed him as president. So, Kifaya, we've had enough of the Mubaraks. Also in 2004, Ayman Noor, an independent member of the Egyptian parliament, formed a party which he named Rad, or Tomorrow. His audacity in challenging Mubarak in the 2005 presidential election captured the public's imagination, but Noor paid a high price for his audacity. He was convicted on dubious charges of election fraud and jailed for over three years, just to discourage other people from thinking they should try and challenge the president in an election. In 2008, a younger generation of computer literate opponents of the regime established the April 6th Youth Movement, whose Facebook page voiced support for workers' rights and really focused on the needs of the working classes as their political agenda. By the end of that year, the group numbered in the tens of thousands, including many who had never previously been engaged in any political activity. So you really can look at Egypt between 2004 and 2010 and see where people were actively mobilizing and challenging what in their own autocratic society they found unacceptable. But whatever their appeal to a younger computer literate generation, Egypt's grassroots movements were no challenge to the deeply entrenched Mubarak regime. In parliamentary elections concluded in December 2010, so just at the same time as the altercation between Faida Hamdi and Mohamed Bouazizi in Sidi Bouzid, you had parliamentary elections in Egypt. The ruling National Democratic Party secured over 80% of the seats in elections widely condemned 
as the most corrupt in Egypt's history. And that was saying something. Egypt really had a tradition of election fraud to be proud of. But 2010, by anybody's account, was the most fraudulent election in Egypt's history. It was widely assumed that the elder Mubarak took such efforts to ensure he had a totally compliant parliament to ensure the succession of his son Gamal would be approved. Disenchanted, most Egyptians opted to boycott elections to deny the new legislature any glimmer of a popular mandate. The amazing thing is, within two months of the election result, the Egyptians had shifted from tactics of boycott to active calls for the fall of the Mubarak regime. Inspired by the Tunisian example, Egyptian activists organized a mass demonstration in Cairo's central Tahrir Square for 25 January 2011. Demonstrators in unprecedented numbers descended on the square, swelling to the hundreds of thousands. Waves of protests known as the January 25 movement swept the major cities of Egypt, Alexandria, Suez, Ismailia, right across the Delta and Upper Egypt alike, and brought the country to a complete standstill. For 18 days, the whole world watched, transfixed as Egypt's reform movement challenged the Mubarak regime and won. The government resorted to dirty tactics against the demonstrators. They released convicted prisoners from jail to try and sow fear and to create an environment of crisis. Policemen in civilian clothes attacked protesters pretending to be pro-Mubarak counter-demonstrators. The president's men went to theatrical lengths, mounting a horse and camel charge against the de demonstrators in Tahrir. Part of it looked like comic opera, part of it was quite tragic. Over 800 people were killed in the course of these demonstrations and hundreds more wounded, thousands wounded. But the Mubarak regime's every attempt at intimidation was repelled with determination and the numbers of protesters only grew. Throughout it, all the Egyptian army, rather like the army in Tunisia, refused to support the regime against the protesters. As Ben Ali before him, Mubarak recognized his position was untenable without the army's support. And so on the 11th of February, 2011, the Egyptian president stood down to jubilation in Tahrir Square and nationwide celebrations. After nearly 30 years in power, Hosni Mubarak was considered unassailable but his fall confirmed that the Arab revolutions of 2011 would not be confined to Tunisia and Egypt, but would spread across the Arab world as a whole. Demonstrations erupted in Benghazi on the 15th of February, marking the beginning of the Libyan revolution against the 41-year um, dictatorship. I was going to say democracy there. <laughs> against the 41-year dictatorship of Muammar al-Qaddafi. That same month, Demonstrators massed in Sana'a and Aden and Taiz to call for the fall of the Yemeni dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. On the 14th of February, protesters descended on Manama's Pearl Roundabout, taking the Arab Spring to Bahrain. And in March, non-violent demonstrations in the southern Syrian town of Dara provoked violent repression from the brutal regime of President Bashar al-Assad, opening the most tragic chapter of the Arab Spring. All of that happened by the time Faida Hamdi finally emerged from prison. Tunisia and the Arab world had changed beyond recognition. Hamdi finally managed to secure a lawyer. She got one of her family members to represent her and was acquitted of all charges in a single court hearing on 19 April 2011. Her release came as Tunisia moved beyond the tragic events of Mohamed Bouazizi's death to address the hopes and challenges of a new political era following the toppling of the Ben Ali regime. She returned to Sidi Bouzid. She returned to her job in the municipality, but she no longer patrolled the markets. She no longer wore her uniform. Instead, she put on civilian clothes and an Islamic headscarf. In her new image, she personified an Arab world transformed from the military autocracy to a new experiment in Islamic democracy. 
Now, the Arab revolutions of 2011 caught the whole world by surprise. After decades of stability under autocratic rulers, states across the Arab were caught up, across the Arab world, were caught up in a seemingly unprecedented period of rapid and, uh, and dramatic change. It was almost as if the tectonic plates of Arab politics had shifted from geological to real time. When confronted with an uncertain future, I would argue that there is no better guide than the past. Now, I would argue that, of course, because I'm a historian, and it is in my professional interest to make that argument. <laughs> but I think there is still some truth to it. And it's a truth that's often lost on political analysts. And speaking as an American, I know uh, from personal experience how when Americans say that something is history, they mean it's irrelevant. And it's my argument to you that nothing could be further from the truth. Western policymakers and intellectuals need to pay far more attention to history if they hope to understand the roots of the Arab Spring and address the terrible challenges confronting the Arab world that have emerged since 2011. The Arab peoples in modern times have grappled with major challenges at home and abroad. They've sought to escape the domination of foreign powers, and they've pressed for reforms at home to make their governments less autocratic and more accountable to the people. These are the great themes of modern Arab history. Now, the Arabs are immensely proud of their history, particularly the first five centuries after the emergence of Islam, spanning the seventh to the 12th century of the current era. This was the age of the great Islamic empires based in Arab cities like Damascus and Baghdad and Cairo and Cordoba, let us remember, for the Iberian Peninsula was part of the Islamic world. You could argue that the early Islamic centuries defined the Arabs as a people who shared a common language in Arabic, ethnic origins that could be traced back to those conquering tribes emerging from the Arabian Peninsula, and for a majority of the people, a common faith in Sunni Islam. The early Islamic period is a source of pride to all Arabs as a bygone age when the Arabs were the dominant power in the world. But obviously it resonates in particular with Islamists, or those who aspire to an Islamic political order, who argue that Arabs were greatest, and by implication will be greatest, when they adhere most closely to their Muslim faith. Starting at the end of the 11th century, foreign invaders began to lay waste to Islamic lands. In 1099, the Crusaders seized Jerusalem after a bloody and violent siege, initiating two centuries of foreign rule under Crusader kingdoms. In 1258, the threat came from the east when the Mongols sacked Baghdad, the seat of the Abbasid capital, and the Tigris flowed red with the blood of its inhabitants. In 1492, I do not need to remind an audience in Tangiers, the last of the Muslims were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula under the Catholic Reconquista. Yet still, Cairo held out as a seat of Islamic power under the Mamluk Sultanate, ruling over all of modern Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and the Red Sea provinces of Saudi Arabia from 1250 until 1517. It was only after the 16th century Ottoman conquests that the Arabs came to be ruled, not from their own cities, but from a foreign capital. You see, since Mehmed the Conqueror seized Constantinople from the Byzantine Empire in 1453, the Ottoman Turks had governed their growing empire from the city they renamed Istanbul, straddling the Straits of the Bosphorus with quarters in both the Asian and European sides of the waterway. Um, Istanbul is a city uh, at the crossroads of the world. It was the seat of a Sunni Muslim empire. But Ottoman Istanbul was very far from Arab lands, 1,500 kilometers from Damascus, 2,200 kilometers from Baghdad, and going over land, 3,800 kilometers from Cairo. Moreover, the administrative language of the Ottoman Empire was Ottoman Turkish, not Arabic. So I would argue that 1517 marked the beginning of the Arabs navigating the modern age by other people's rules. 
The Ottomans ruled the Arab world for four of the past five centuries. Over this expansive time, the Ottoman Empire changed tremendously, and the rules changed accordingly. In the first century after the Ottoman conquest, the Ottoman rules were none too demanding. The Arabs had to recognize the authority of the Sultan, and they had to respect both the laws of God, or the Sharia, and the laws of the Sultan, or Irade. Non-Muslim minorities were allowed to organize their own affairs under their own communal leadership in return for paying a poll tax to the state. All in all, most of the Arab peoples seem to view their place in the dominant world empire of the age with equanimity as Muslims in a great Muslim empire, and an empire that expanded right across North Africa, but of course never embraced Morocco. In the 18th century, the rules changed significantly. The Ottoman Empire had reached the limits of its expansion during the 17th century, and in 1699 suffered its first loss of territory to its European neighbors. Short on cash, the empire began to auction both state office and whole provinces of the empire to amass money through tax farms to generate the revenues of state. This allowed powerful men in remote provinces to take control over vast territories in which they accumulated sufficient wealth and power to challenge the authority of the Ottoman government. So you'll have the emergence of local rulers controlling huge tracts of land and beginning to rival the Ottoman center in control over whole parts of the Arab world. And this was certainly true in Egypt, under the Mamluks, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Damascus, Iraq, and Arabia. By the 19th century, the Ottomans initiated a period of major reforms intended to address both these internal challenges of local leaders, but also the dangers that were coming from their European neighbors. This age of reforms gave rise to a new set of rules reflecting novel ideas of citizenship that were really coming out of Europe. The Ottoman reforms tried to establish full equal rights and responsibilities for all subjects, regardless of religion or ethnicity. This led to an expansion of the role of Arabs in administration, the entry of Christians into military service, and a common set of taxes applied on all Ottoman subjects. The Ottomans promoted a new national identity in Ottomanism, which tried to transcend the different ethnic and religious divides of Ottoman society. Now, these reforms failed to protect the Ottomans from European encroachment, but they did allow the empire to reinforce its hold over the Arab provinces, which took on increasing importance for the Ottomans as nationalism reduced the presence of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, as more and more of the Balkan provinces separated through nationalist movements to emerge as Bulgaria and Romania and Greece and Montenegro and Serbia. But the same ideas that inspired Ottoman reform gave rise to new ideas of nation and community, which made some in the Arab world dissatisfied with their position in the Ottoman Empire. They began to chafe against Ottoman rules that increasingly were blamed for the relative backwardness of the Arabs at the start of the 20th century. Contrasting past greatness with present subordination within an Ottoman Empire that was retreating before stronger European neighbors, many in the Arab world called for reforms within their own society and aspired to independence from the Ottoman world. And that opportunity came with the fall of the Ottomans in 1918 when many in the Arab world believed they were on the threshold of a new age of independence and national greatness. They hoped to resurrect a greater Arab kingdom from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire, and they took encouragement from U.S. President Woodrow Wilson's calls for national self-determination, as set out in his famous 14 points. But as we know, they were to be bitterly disappointed, as they found that the new world order would be based on European imperial rather than Wilsonian rules. The British and French used the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 to apply the modern state system to the Arab world, 
with all Arab lands except Central and Southern Arabia falling under some form of European colonial rule. In Syria and Lebanon, newly emerging from the Ottoman Empire, the French gave their colonies a republican form of government. The British, in contrast, endowed their possessions in Iraq and Transjordan with a Westminster form of constitutional monarchy. Palestine was the exception, where the promise to create a Jewish national home against the opposition of the indigenous Palestinian population undermined all efforts to form a national government and so was ruled out as an outright colony through the interwar years. Each new Arab state in this colonial framework was given a national capital which served as the seat of government. Rulers were pressed to draft constitutions and to create parliaments that were elected by the people. Borders, in many cases quite artificial, were negotiated between neighboring states, often with some degree of acrimony, some degree of dispute. Now, in the interwar years, many Arab nationalists resisted these measures, which they believed represented a politics of divide and rule, carving the Arab world into small states, the easier to dominate them. They believed that the only way the Arab world could regain its rightful status as a respected world power would be achieved through broader Arab unity. But in keeping with the new European rules, meaningful political action was confined to the borders of these new Arab states. And one of the enduring legacies of the colonial period is this tension between nation-state nationalism, the feeling that an Egyptian has to the state of Egypt or an Iraqi to the state of Iraq, and pan-Arab nationalist ideologies. National movements emerged in the first half of the 20th century within individual colonial states in opposition to foreign rule, the Lebanese struggling to achieve independence from the French, the uh, Palestinians trying to do the same with the British. No meaningful Arab-wide national movement was possible so long as the Arab world was divided between Britain and France. And by the time the Arab states began to secure their independence from colonial rule in the 1940s and the 1950s, the divisions between Arab states had become permanent. The problem was that most Arab citizens believed smaller nationalisms based around colonial creations were fundamentally illegitimate. For those who aspired to Arab greatness in the 20th century, only the broader Arab nationalist movements offered the prospect of achieving the critical mass and the unity of purpose necessary to restore the Arabs to their rightful place among the powers of the day. The colonial experience that the Arabs as a community of nations rather than as a national community, and the Arabs remain disappointed by the results. Now, European influence in world affairs was, of course, shattered by the Second World War. The post-war years proved a period of decolonization as the states of Asia and Africa secured independence from their former colonial rulers, often by force of arms. It was the United States and the Soviet Union who emerged as the dominant powers in the aftermath of the Second World War. And the rivalry between them defined the rules of a new age which came to be called the Cold War. It was then that Moscow and Washington emerged into an intense competition for global dominance. As the United States and the USSR attempted to integrate the Arab world into their respective spheres of influence, the Middle East became one of the most important arenas of superpower rivalry in the Cold War. Even in that age of national independence, the Arab world found its room to maneuver constrained by foreign rules, in this case, the rules of the Cold War. The rules of the Cold War were fairly straightforward. You could have good relations with the United States or with the USSR, but you couldn't really be allied to both. The Arab people, generally had no interest in American anti-communism or Soviet theories of dialectical materialism. Their governments tried to pursue an intermediate path 
through the non-aligned movement. But it didn't work. Eventually, every state in the Arab world was forced to take sides, either with America or with the Soviets. Those states that entered into the Soviet sphere of influence called themselves progressive, but were described in the West as radical Arab states. This group included every country that had undergone a revolution in the second half of the 20th century, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, Algeria, Yemen, and Libya. Those Arab states that were deemed to side with the West, the liberal republics like Tunisia and Lebanon, and the monarchies, Morocco, Jordan, and the Gulf states, were dubbed reactionaries by the progressive Arab states, but were called moderates in the West. What resulted, basically, were patron-client relations between the superpowers and the Arabs, in which Arab states secured arms for their military and development aid for their economies from their superpower patrons. So long as there were two superpowers, at least there were checks and balances in the system. Neither the Soviets nor the Americans could afford to take unilateral action in the Middle East for fear of provoking a hostile reaction from their rival superpower. Government officials in Washington and Moscow lived in fear of provoking a nuclear holocaust, and they worked day and night to prevent the Middle East from sparking just that kind of conflagration. And Arab leaders learned very quickly how to play the superpowers off each other, using the threat of defecting from one side to the other to secure more arms or more development aid from their patron state. Even so, by the end of the Cold War, the Arabs were well aware that they were no closer to achieving the degree of independence or of development or of respect to which they had aspired at the start of that era. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, however, the Arab world was to enter a new age on even less favorable terms. The Cold War came to an end shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. For the Arab world, the new unipolar age began with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990. It wasn't the invasion of Kuwait itself. It was that moment when the Soviet Union voted in favor of a UN Security Council resolution that gave an American-led coalition the right to use force against the Kremlin's old ally, Iraq. That was the moment when the writing really was on the wall for all of the USSR's allies in the Arab world. The certainties of the Cold War era had given way to an age of unconstrained American power, and many in the region feared the worst. Now, it's not as though America has pursued consistent policies in the Middle East since the end of the Cold War. Four American presidents pursued radically different agendas. For, uh, for President George H.W. Bush, who was in office as the Soviet Union collapsed, the end of the Cold War was a moment of great optimism in which he predicted a new world order. And I think he meant by that a better world order. Under Bill Clinton, internationalism and engagement remained the hallmarks of American policy. With the advent of the neoconservatives to power, following the election of George W. Bush in 2000, the United States turned to unilateralism. In the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 attacks, these policies had a devastating impact on the region as a whole, leading to a war on terrorism that focused on the Muslim world with the Arabs as prime suspects. Barack Obama sought to reverse many of the Bush administration's policies and reduce America's military presence in the region, though in the process, reducing American influence. The rules of the unipolar age of American dominance have proved the most disadvantageous to the Arab world in modern times. With no alternate power to constrain American action, Arab governments found themselves facing actual invasion, in the case of Iraq, and the threat of regime change. It would be no exaggeration to describe the years since the 9-11 attacks as the worst in Arab history, 
with the Arab Spring serving as a brief hiatus. What Samir Kassir observed in 2004 holds ever more true today. It's not pleasant being Arab these days. But let me go from the engagement of the Arab world to the dominant rules of the age to that other major theme of Arab history, which is trying to constrain the power of autocracy at home. And I would argue that for most of the past two centuries, the Arabs have struggled for their independence, not just from foreign powers, but to constrain the autocratic power of their rulers at home. The Arab Spring revolutions were but the latest chapter in a centuries-old struggle for accountable government and rule of law. Until the end of the 18th century, absolutism was the norm in Europe and the Mediterranean world as a whole. Only Great Britain and the Dutch Republic had subordinated the powers of the monarch to an elected body before the French Revolution of 1789. After 1789, constitutions begin to spread across the West with some speed. The United States in 1789, Poland and France both in 1791, Norway in 1814, Belgium in 1831. A new political order was emerging in which rulers' powers were constrained by law and subjects were elevated to that higher legal status of citizens. Arab visitors to Europe in the first quarter of the 19th century, returned captivated by the novel ideas they had encountered in Paris and London. The Egyptian cleric Rifat Tahtawi translated all 74 articles of the French Constitutional Charter of 1814 into Arabic upon his return from Paris in 1831. Living under the autocratic rule of Mohammed Ali Pasha, Tahtawi marveled at the constraints of the French Charter imposed on its king and the protection it afforded to French citizens. The Tunisian reformer, Khaledina Tunisi, inspired by Tahtawi's writings, advocated for a constitution to contain the arbitrary rule of Tunisia's governors. It is perhaps not coincidental that the two Arab states that were the first to introduce constitutions, Tunisia in 1861, and Egypt in 1882, were also the first two states to undergo Arab Spring revolutions. It's well worth noting that the struggle to constrain autocracy really dates back to this point in the 19th century. The next wave of constitutional reform coincided with the introduction of European colonial rule in the aftermath of the First World War. As already mentioned, that was part of the state system that came with European colonialism, perhaps a silver lining. The Egyptian constitution of 1923, the Iraqi constitution of 1925, the Lebanese constitution of 1926, and the Syrian charter of 1930 were each examples of the Arab struggle for independence from European colonial powers on the basis of legitimate government and the rule of law. While these constitutions endowed Arab states with elected multi-party legislatures, the colonial authorities did their utmost to undermine any exercise of Arab sovereignty. As a result, liberal constitutional government came to be compromised as an idea that was an extension of European colonial rule. The rejection of Arab liberalism came with defeat in the 1948 Palestine War. The lack of military preparedness alienated patriotic officers from their kings and presidents, and defeat at the hands of the armed forces of the young state of Israel, who had until that point been dismissed by Arab propaganda as mere Jewish gangs, undermined citizen confidence in the newly independent governments of the Arab world. The Arabs entered a new revolutionary age with military coups beginning in Syria in 1949, in Egypt in 1952, in Iraq in 1958, in Yemen in 1962, in Libya in 1969, 
not to mention the Algerian War of Independence, which resulted in independence in 1962, a revolution of sort, that brought decisive men of action to power at the head of technocratic governments, intensely nationalist, indeed Arab nationalist. The military regimes promised a new age of social justice, of economic development, of military strength, and independence from outside powers. All the new military rulers demanded in return was total obedience from their citizens. And I say that without irony. It is in the nature of military order that subordinates obey orders. And military men brought to government that same mentality, that citizens would obey orders. It was a social contract of sorts. And for over a half century, Arab citizens were willing to suspend their efforts to constrain autocratic rule in return for government that would provide for their needs. By the start of the 21st century, the old Arab social contract was well and truly broken. Since the 1950s, autocratic governments had promised to provide all the needs of their citizens in return for the absolute exercise of power over politics. By 2000, all but Saudi Arabia and the smaller oil-rich states had, prov had proved incapable of living up to those promises. Increasingly, there was only a narrow band of friends and family who were the prime beneficiaries of any economic opportunities. The level of inequality between rich and poor in Arab states rose alarmingly. Rather than address their citizens' legitimate grievances, Arab states responded to any sign of discontent by becoming ever more repressive. Worse, these repressive regimes were actively seeking to preserve their family's control over politics by dynastic succession. We've already mentioned how so many of these autocratic presidents were grooming sons to succeed them. Not only was the Arab social contract broken, but these failing regimes threatened to perpetuate themselves. In 2011, the Arab people rose up in popular movements seeking to restore control over their rulers. There was a placard in Tahrir Square in 2011 that really ca captured this for me. It read, the people should not fear their government. Governments should fear their people. For one brief moment, the Arab Spring Revolution succeeded in making Arab rulers fear their citizens. Unfortunately, the moment did not last as revolution gave way to counter-revolution and strong men returned to power. Rather than a new age of democracy, many of these revolutions created power vacuums and those vacuums were filled by men with guns, not men with ideas. Everywhere that is, but in Tunisia, where the movement first erupted with the fateful confrontation between Faida Hamdi and Mohamed Bouazizi in December 2010. And it's too early to know if the fragile constitutional order that has emerged in Tunisia will prove a harbinger of a future Arab social order that other Arab countries will follow the example of Tunisia to a new age of accountable government and citizens' rights, or whether Tunisia will emerge from the story of 2011 as the unique success to survive the Arab Spring. Thank you. If you have any questions, please get a microphone. They're on both sides. Well, first of all, thank you for your uh, very interesting lecture. Yeah. Bah, puisque vous parlez français, je vais en profiter. Allez je voulais juste euh, rapidement euh, dire que est-ce que vous pensez que euh, lorsqu'on parle de, de l'histoire, il y a une euh, réalité de, de cause à effet Je ne pense pas. Je pense qu'il y a un cheminement naturel, la plupart du temps imprévisible, que juste après coup, on essaye de, de trouver des explications. Par exemple, on n'est pas sans savoir qu'on a eu beaucoup de, de cas de, de, de gens qui se sont immolés par le feu. Heureusement, euh, ça n'a pas eu les, les, les mêmes conséquences euh, néfastes. 
donc, pour résumer, je pense qu'il y a juste un cheminement naturel, imprévisible, mais sûr. Et je ferai un parallèle un peu incongru, ce qui s'est passé aux états unis euh, avec Donald Trump. C'était imprévisible, mais après coup, on se rend compte qu'il y avait un cheminement naturel qu'on ne pouvait pas maîtriser et qui a donné donc euh, cette, cette élection. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I, I'll answer you in English, if I may. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. It's an excellent question. And I would not argue that there is a natural line of explanation in history. But that's different from trying to understand in going back to history uh, what the root causes of events were. Because when we are faced with big changes, then we must make sense of them. And it is the duty of the historian to help to show where movements have emerged from, what po popular grievances might have been, and to help us to make sense of our present. I, I don't think anyone will claim that 2011 was inevitable or predictable. It was astonishing. It caught the world by surprise. I don't know of any analyst who had predicted a rash of region-wide revolutionary movements that could act so effectively against so many dictators. Similarly, if you had told me 18 months ago that Donald Trump was going to be my president, I would have thought that that was very unlikely. But we are where we are. And when you wish to analyze the major events that are shaping our world, the question is, where do you turn? And when I say turn to history, it's not because I believe that there is a pattern to history, or that history repeats itself, but that there are the clues to the mystery of the present in the past. And if we understand the past well, we might avoid repeating historic mistakes. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Um, as you know, the sixth anniversary of the Moroccan 20th February movement uh, is this Monday. Um, so what clues in history Tell us about the Moroccan experience and what may lay, lie ahead. Mm. The nice thing when I come to Morocco <laughs> is I never speak on a history that I know less well than my audience. <laughs> But it's a question I'd love to know your views on because it is, it's truly not anything that I would feel I had the authority to match yours on. So will you catch up with me after the lecture yes. and perhaps over? <laughs> Sir. Microphone. Has, you have to have a ah, microphone. We have a mic here. Sorry. What do you think saved uh, uh, Morocco from the drastic uh, Arab Spring consequences? It's a really good question. And it wasn't just Morocco. There seemed to have been a fault line between republics that were vulnerable and monarchies that seemed better prepared to withstand the pressures. But I say withstand rather than immunity to the pressures because we were all aware of the way in which certain Gulf states viewed with real alarm developments that might threaten them. I'm speaking specifically about the measures that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates took to intervene in Bahrain to stop the movement from developing in a way that might affect a GCC state and to the extraordinary invitation that the GCC extended to a country so far from the Gulf as your own when they invited Jordan and Morocco to join the Gulf Cooperation Council, at which point you saw the thinking was banding monarchy together to protect it against the threat of popular uprisings. So they were worried. But why did monarchy withstand better? I think that monarchy probably enjoys more legitimacy in the countries where it is the form of government than the republics which have come to power in most cases through revolutionary change. So you've had the notion that change can be, a change of regime can bring a change of policies in republics, which is not the experience you've had in monarchies. It might be part of the solution. It might also be affection for monarchs in countries like your own or the success of the policies they pursued in providing for enough of their people that they had more of a stake in the status quo 
than in a revolutionary change. I was just wondering the role of demographics, because this part of the world of which we start here in the Marib and we go just to Ramashek, it's very young, isn't yeah. it? What is 75% of the Egyptian population is under 25. This is to be, t and most of them have a cell phone. So I think between communication and, which I think is actually very new, so I think trying to predict is difficult, but to assess, but also respect the means of communication, as you mentioned, the speed and the role of Al Jazeera with its sort of pigeon Arab that is comprehensible and also the images, wasn't it? I mean, you couldn't communicate as clearly mm -hmm. in the past without these images. So there's a role of television, there's a role of communication. So this is new age. Is it not Gutenberg's invention of the movable type? Is this not the internet of our era, which allows people to communicate quickly and reconsider? Mm -hmm. But I think the young population, we're in for a fascinating ride <laughs> to watch. I'm yep. not pessimistic because something must come out of it, and the young are um, I, just a huge upheaval of which we're in the middle of. But right. I think we might be quite surprised where it's going. I need your mic by your mouth, because you're, you're going to be waving no, in for those I'm poor sorry, people yeah, in Maine who are joining it. us. You're going to be waving in and out no, of the way. No, I'm sorry, but I get but your point. Yes. And right. I think uh, the whole demographic question is a really interesting one, because the metaphor of a volcano is what is usually cited of a structure in which sort of two-thirds of the population is yet to be satisfied in its basic needs of education, job, accommodation, all the foundations to make a family and have a stake in the future that will make them constructive and stable members of society. And that there is this body that needs to be addressed and frankly is not being addressed. Their, their engagement with social media made them a very effective force in mobilizing numbers so large that it took the fear out of politics. And that whole notion of no longer being afraid, there was strength in numbers. Where I think the young generation needs to think very seriously is how to operationalize their strength. Because when they succeeded in toppling dictators, they didn't know how to organize to get engaged politically. The strength of their movement was it had no leaders. The regime couldn't go and arrest 20 people and stop the movement because everyone was a leader who was tweeting or Facebooking instructions on where to go or posting pictures of what was happening. So it's now the next challenge to feed your optimism is for the young generation to go one step further in their political evolution not to create 60 personality parties to contest elections, but one. And to m mobilize for political action so that they can get in into the parliament and then be a part of drafting the constitution and be in the government. And in that, I think there's a whole other level of revolution that will need to follow. But very interesting, I think youth were a very big part of the success in Tunisia uh, brief reflection there, university students who were unemployed went to all the sessions of the Constitutional Assembly and they wrote down what every member of the Assembly said, rather like Hansards does for British Parliament. No one did this officially, no one asked them to do it. They did it for accountability. And it was such a wonderfully intelligent thing to do because suddenly people felt responsible for what they said in the Assembly. And they would go to talk to these students and ask them, did you quote me right? Here, I can give you my text. They were suddenly conscious. So there are ways to take your power one step further to protect the interests of your generation. And I think that's where the volcano must go if its eruptions are to have a constructive uh, end. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for your interesting lecture. Um, so you have been speaking about the history of, of the Arabs, about the recent uh, history of the Arabs to like, uh, speaking about the, uh, the the Arab Spring that turned out to an Arab winter, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is, um, what is the relationship? I mean, or if, if there is any, and well, it's a question, and I'm waiting for for an answer if if it's possible. What is the relationship between um, the uh, oil uh, oil state? I mean, the rich countries in the Middle East uh, and the uh, let's say the weapon uh, industries. 
is the future of the Arabs is between it, these two hands. Mm. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you. It was very interesting to watch what happened to oil through the turmoil of the revolutions. As a historian, I have certain formulas at work. Uh, one is when you have regional crisis in the Middle East, then you experience a crisis on oil markets and prices go very high. Didn't work this way. I know we had, we had tremendous turmoil in the region uh, and oil prices have been going down and they've crashed. There are explanations that have to do with supply and demand, tapping new sources by fracking that have allowed people to break away from a reliance on that one region's oil supplies for global energy needs. And so in a funny way, in the past five years, the role of oil in this discussion has been reduced as an important factor in terms of power the region might exercise. And instead, we've seen something, again, quite unexpected, which is the vulnerability of oil-rich states to contain political challenges in a time of low, low oil prices. So many of these countries that five years ago were enjoying very, very high oil and could do a lot more politically to satisfy their own citizens by giving away a lot of money. Saudi Arabia gave away billions in 2011 in a bid to um, ensure social harmony. They can't do it now. They're having to take out public loans through the sale of bonds. They're starting to introduce value-added tax. They're, they're quite aware of the limits of what the state can do with oil resources. And this probably means that countries in the Gulf whose social contract was preserved, they continue to exercise a monopoly on politics because they continue to provide for the needs of their citizens is going to be challenged in ways that are going to bring them in line with regional realities. I say that a country like Egypt would love to face the economic problems of a country like the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia. You know, these are rich people's problems. But when the expectations of your societies have been set by rich people's privileges, and then you have to tighten the belt, then it will put pressure for change. So I, to me, the story of oil is it is no longer able, it's no longer as effective in propping up oil-rich states from having to address political demands. And as they are being driven more towards taxation, then there will, I think, be demands for more representation. It's, it's inevitable. Thanks to you. Um, I have a question about the next 50 years or the next 30 years. Uh, do you think the maps of the Middle East will change? I mean, maybe we'll have two Iraq or a Kurdistan or a shorter Syria, bigger Jordan, right. maybe a shorter Saudi Arabia. We, we don't know what will happen. What is your point of view about that? I don't often get asked the 20 to 50 year perspective, but it's kind of liberating. I like it. <laughs> I've not come with my crystal ball, so my predictions are going to be pretty weak. You've already identified what I think are the greatest pressures on the frontiers of the region. I think the Kurdish search for national satisfaction is going to put pressure on Iran, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. And if there were to be changes in the boundaries of the post-World War I era, I would look to the Kurds first and foremost. And I think the other area in which boundaries remain to be settled is between Israel and the Palestinians. The world is confronting a reality now where continued Israeli settlement in the West Bank is making a two-state solution a less likely possibility. Mr. Trump, in his own way, is contributing to the confusion. But with 400,000 
in many cases, ideologically committed Israelis living in the West Bank. Even the scope of the State of Israel to force them, to repatriate them within the, the, the Green Line boundaries, I think is beyond the capacity, certainly of Netanyahu's government. I, I think it is a stuff of civil war for the Israelis. Uh, these are zealots. We've, we've seen, you know, with what difficulty Israel withdrew from Gaza and Sinai, which were not in any way as ideologically charged for the settler movement as the ter territory they will call Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. But the one-state solution as an apartheid state will isolate Israel and will confront it with problems. There, you know, is a, a real challenge that the international community faces. And the way to address that may mean in addressing boundaries in that region more generally as part of a broader regional stabilization package where maybe some sort of federation and softer borders, dare I say it, a European Union type of solution might actually provide more stability where it's easier for people and goods to move across boundaries and where national identity isn't reinforced by hard boundaries. But to get there would require such measures of confidence between all the peoples in the region that um, it's, it's hard to imagine from where we sit now. It would take 30 to 50 years to achieve that degree of confidence. But those are the two areas where I would see most strain. Many people predict a breakup, breakup of Iraq. There are many analysts in Washington drawing a map of the Middle East in a kind of new Sykes-Picot exercise that I have no confidence in. I feel that over the past 100 years, the states of the Arab world have taken on a sovereign reality. However artificially they may have been engendered, the past 100 years' struggles have created different peoples in Iraqis and Syrians and in Lebanese and in Jordanians. And for that reason, I think that there will be more continuity than change over 30 to 50 years. But those would be the areas that I see under most pressure. And the solution that I would like to look forward to would be a softening of boundaries and a kind of federation, because in the end, they're going to come down to real resource sharing issues about water, about gas, about oil, about arable land, about food. And you know, continuing on a war footing comes at too high a price for all of the populations in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. First, I want to thank you, Professor, for, for this very insightful and uh, in-depth look in history. First, my question is, what is your advice for the Arab youth? And my second question is, uh, what really motivated you to become in the, mm -hmm. a Middle East expert, if I may? <laughs> and thank you so much. <laughs> You're going to get my whole life story with that question. <laughs> I think my advice for Arab youth is definitely to keep up the struggle, to continue to press for the dignity of citizens' rights, so that your frustrations with your political situation don't cripple you from achieving what you would like to achieve in your professional lives, in your personal lives. You know, I, I don't want to see the generation of 2011 a, a generation of martyrdom. And hundreds of people lost their lives in Syria. Hundreds of thousands have lost their lives. And so keep up the struggle, but in, in ways that are politically intelligent. And so, as I said before, to organize, not in many personality parties. You know, a political order works best when there are two or three parties that are big enough to get a critical mass, can win an election, can form a government. But where there are other parties so that the one who loses the election can hold the government to account in opposition, can put pressure on the government to perform, and pr to provide an alternate option for voters if they don't like the way the government's behaving in the next election. I avoid the use of the word democracy because it's come to be charged with many uh, implications of foreign domination. George Bush kind of ruined the word by making it an American policy associated with neoconservative American policies. So let's not talk about democracy. Let's just talk about the right to choose and change your rulers by peaceful means and to be involved in politics and to live under a rule of law with citizens' rights. I think people in the Arab world don't like the word democracy, but when I use those criteria with people, they all want those things. It's dignity, it's security, it's freedom, it's responsibility. And I think 
for Arab youth. Those are all very important objectives to pursue. And I'll give you a very brief reason why I became a Middle East historian. Um, I am the son of a merchant of death. My father worked for the arms industry. He worked for the aerospace company Northrop, which makes fighter planes. Morocco has F-5 fighter planes in its air force. In fact, those airplanes almost killed King Hassan II. Um, when we, um, we were living in Europe as a child, uh, he was asked to open an office in the Middle East because Saudi Arabia wished to buy F-5s for their air force. This is a government-to-government -government business. And so we moved to Beirut in 1971. And I went to school there, and I lived there for five years, witnessed amazing history, including the outbreak of the Lebanese Civil War. And my family and I stayed in Lebanon for the first 10 months of the Civil War before finally we left and we moved to Egypt, where again I got to see amazing history unfold. And what I said that hops on an airplane and flies to Israel. Oh my God. I'm sitting with my Egyptian friends watching the president of Egypt address the Knesset. Was he a hero or was he a traitor? My Egyptian friends didn't know. They were very proud of their president for getting the world's attention, but they all their lives have been trained to think of Israel as an enemy. So when I went to university, I studied economics and I was not a good economist. So I decided to do a degree in Middle Eastern studies knowing that I'd always been fascinated with what I had lived in for eight years of my growing up until I finished high school and went and did a degree in Middle Eastern studies and from there on I was dragged right into it. It was no getting out. I left economics behind, I loved history and I found what I wanted to do and actually was rather good at it. So here I am. Bonsoir, professor. Bonsoir. Je ne sais pas si vous avez entendu parler de Mohsin Fikri. C'est le Bouazizi de al Husima. C'est le vendeur de poissons qui s'est écrasé lorsque vous avez entendu l'histoire et l'incident et les, manifesta les manifestations qui se sont déclenchées après. Ouais. Donc, est-ce qu'on pourrait voir là un autre cas de Bouazizi Ou bien parce que c'est une région spécifique, la région du Rif, qui s'est vue euh, avec beaucoup de pression pendant son histoire. Euh, c'est la goutte qui a fait déborder l'eau la réaction de, des gens, du peuple, les manifestations qui se sont déclenchées. Comment expliquez-vous cette réaction Again, if I may answer in English. Oui, oui, yes, yes. Of course, we followed the story of the fish merchant and of the demonstrations that followed. And the Western press was very quick to draw the parallel between his death and Boazizi's. And the reaction of people was, it seems to me, completely natural to be outraged by this act. It was an injustice. And I think the government was very quick to respond, not just because it was an injustice, but because they feared it could set disorder in motion. I have nothing but respect for the Kingdom of Morocco, but the Kingdom of Morocco faces tremendous challenges in human development terms. You have a high level of poverty. You have development problems. You have education problems. You have tremendous variations between the countryside and the cities. You speak about the, the reef as an area under pressure. The reef has often felt itself one of the more neglected parts of Morocco. But I, I've come back to Tangiers after 10 years. I haven't been in this city. And it seems to me that there has been tremendous investment that has been going on here. Precisely, it seems to me, in an effort by the state to break down this perception that the North is neglected. And I think that the government is, in many ways, looking to address the issues that would create revolutionary tensions before they get out of control. Can they continue to do so? I hope so. Because I think the population of Morocco is so big and the problems that it faces are so substantial that revolution, I don't think, will necessarily bring solutions to people's problems better than addressing them through, through government action. But I think here again, as I said in my previous answer, the pressure is on the people to demand 
of their government, justice and dignity and protection. And when you have an event such as the death of the fish merchant, which is such an affront to those values, then people must respond and force the government to address it. It seems to me that Morocco has come through that crisis. So far, so good. But it is a lesson of just how thin the line is between stability and disorder. And I think people demand better of their government than what they have had in past years. They, their expectations are higher. We have two more questions. Marhaban. Marhabtin. Uh, <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say shukran for uh, this magnificent lecture. Also, I want to thank the University of New England and Mr. Anwar Majid for this outstanding opportunity. I only have a small question. It's related to the problematic of democracy in the Arab countries. Uh, do you really believe that democracy can be the solution to achieve or uh, to achieve a better future of the Arabs? Because some say, or the, the, the Arab Spring, which we call it the hot summer Arab, showed that democracy and high level of illiteracy and ignorance can never work. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Thank you. First off, could I second what you said? And could we all give a huge round of applause to Anwar Majid? Because this has happened because of him, and I'm thrilled to be here. And on my first visit to the University of New England, I'm absolutely blown away by what's been established here in Tangiers. This is a magnificent facility, and it makes me want to abandon history and go back and study science and come back as an undergraduate here. <laughs> so congratulations to the University of New England. What a fabulous flagship in North Africa. Whew. You know, I avoided the democracy word all through my talk, and I gave you a series of criteria that I thought were the aspirations. And I am going to say, yes, I do believe that the Arab world is fully capable of not only seeking to fulfill those aspirations, but in contributing to them by being responsible citizens, exercising their vote, holding their government to account. You are absolutely right to point to the need for an educated public for citizens to be able to really participate in an informed way. But you know, I'm watching the way in which deliberate disinformation has become so accepted in the United States, a well-educated country with one of the most established democratic systems. The challenge then is about intention and will and fighting against distortion, even more than it is about achieving a high level of literacy and, and knowledge. An honest person well informed by reliable news is going to make a better decision than somebody with a master's degree who's only following the news of the world through a Facebook feed or a Twitter feed of like-minded people motivated by hate and believing false stories. The challenges to democratic, uh, democratic governments that have emerged in the past five years are so substantial that it makes me worry almost more for what's going to happen in the United States or in Europe than what's going to happen in the Arab world. If there was a challenge that the Arabs could not surmount after their revolutions in 2011, it was the, the, the difficulty in going from total repression of political participation to meaningful organization and political maturity. It takes time to create parties. It takes time to put forward a political platform. It takes experience to learn how to go on a campaign trail and win an election. And people who have been denied the right to participate in politics at all for decades, all their lives, found it difficult to fulfill that very quickly. And very quickly, the vacuum was filled, as I said, by militias, by men with guns, rather than by parties and men with ideas. So there has been a setback to the aspirations of the Arab world. That does not take away my confidence in the ability of the Arab peoples to secure 
a free and fair political system and the rule of law. There's enough in their history in terms of the constitutions they've drafted, the parliaments they've elected, for us to see the Arabs having a history of doing just that. I wouldn't want to be so blinded by the history of autocracy not to recognize the history of liberalism either. And, and I think the motives that drove people in 2011 are still very much alive today. The real problem is the fear has come back. And people suddenly realize that with chaos, you get no jobs. With power vacuums, you get militias. And that goal of being able to have a dignified life and provide for your families, your children go to school safely, is in jeopardy. And it's it set things back, but I think that there's going to be an assertion of those citizenship claims again, whether we call them democracy or you know, choosing and changing. It, it's it's going to come back again. I'm ever optimistic of the ability of the Arab people. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for that talk. Um, I like to think that I know a lot of information, and then I like listen on talks like that, and I realize I actually don't. So I appreciate it. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, so I guess like my question is. Like, just like from everything you've said, just like the overall, I guess, general history of the Arab Spring and just like the Arab world and um, like the major and like monumental events that they've gone through, how do you, th like, how do you think the, I guess, like what's going on in the United States right now and the US government and the um, Trump administration, like what kind of impact do you think that it's gonna have on the Arab world um, and just like the people? Um, and can you talk from both? as a historian, but also as just like a educated um, American, white male American. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, I think on this one, I'm just gonna speak as a white male American <laughs> and not as a historian, because I mean, that sets me as a voter. And let me tell you my fears. I mean, too long, as a liberal American, a white liberal American voter. I have laughed at the Trump phenomenon. I've made jokes out of this. You know, on election night, I stopped laughing. And I, I watch what's unfolding, and I'm aware of the damage that can be done in our country. The damage is twofold. I mean, it's manyfold, obviously, but the two things that strike me most off is, actually, there are really important institutions of checks and balances that could be thrown into jeopardy. So there could be damage done to our political system. It's never been tried in quite this way. We've, we've not had someone who's such a populist elected president of America, as far as I know. And I think it's put our system under tremendous strain. It's interesting to see how the system's responding. You know, the judiciary is exercising its separation of powers in a way that gives me hope. But I think a lot of damage can be done. And I think that damage goes not just to how America is governed or the way we're polarized between conservative Americans and liberal Americans. And we talk about each other in, in ways that suggest we don't actually believe we're the same country anymore and don't recognize the patriotism of the other side. So as a liberal, I want to say right off the bat, I want to reach right across and shake a hand with the guy I might have made fun of for voting for Trump and say, look, buddy, I don't doubt your patriotism. We'll have our differences in how we want to run this country, but let's keep the institutions together, okay? We gotta get there. So don't polarize too much, hold it all together. America's not just, I mean, the, the presidency uh, is not just confined to the United States. It exercises power over the whole damn world. And we're watching ways in which rash actions by this administration are shaking things up right around the world. Old alliances are being put into question. Long-standing American policies and way of doing things. And when it comes to the Middle East, you know, there, there are real ramifications here. One, strong leader populists are taking courage from Trump's victory. You know, Egypt had a counter-revolution. Brought Abdel Fattah Sisi to the presidency. Though he took off his uniform, resigned his commission, it's a military dictatorship. And it's the worst mi military dictatorship that this historian's ever seen Egypt afflicted with. He has more people in prison and he's doing nastier things to them than Abdel Nasser ever did. And I liked Abdel Nasser. And Sisi's no Abdel Nasser. He looks to Trump and he sees the way forward. 
He wanted to be clear that he was the first person to congratulate Trump on the telephone after the election results came in. He's desperate to be over in Washington and received. He wants Trump's way of doing business to be recognized as a new normal, so Egypt can do business that way too. And I just saw Prime Minister Netanyahu being interviewed with Trump. And, you know, he hasn't smiled that much in the White House in eight years. <laughs> you know? Every time we saw him in the White House under President Obama, he looked pretty unhappy. He looked really happy. Because the new normal means, hey, we can do 6,000 housing units in the settlements, and this guy's not going to object. And what you're breaking in the process is really serious. And this is the new normal. So, I'm worried. You know, we haven't had a month of this administration. I can't imagine a year of this. <laughs> I can't imagine four years of it. And they're talking about him getting reelected. God help me. God help us all. I just can't deal with it. I mean, the worst thing about the election result on a personal level was I was looking forward to ending the idiot conversation. I'm stuck in this idiot conversation for four years now. I'm feeling sorry for myself there. <laughs> Um, I'm worried. Damage can be done. And if this becomes a new normal, then strong men, autocratic behavior, not accountable to government, don't recognize the rule of law, violating values that we all held to as hallmarks of advanced society. That's serious damage. So I'm not joking anymore. I can't, I can't make laughs anymore. I just can't believe it anymore. It's good to be in 10 years. Thank you. Thank you so much.